Hi, I'm Terry Ryber. I'm a PAC TV member here in Plymouth. And today I'm visiting with John Chapman, who is a Republican candidate for the 9th Congressional, Congressional District in Massachusetts. John, welcome to PAC TV. Thank you, Terry. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your background. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, um, I, I don't know how far you want me to go back, but I'm actually. Uh, they just give some background about my family. I'm actually the youngest of seven children, believe it or not. And, uh, uh, and I also, my father was a decorated World War II veteran. I'm just trying to give your viewers a sense of where some of my values come from. Mm -hmm. uh, and he flew in the South Pacific in combat missions. Wow. And he taught me a great deal about uh, family, faith, patriotism, and, and, and really about public service. Um, also, I've been married for 18 years to my wife, Diane, and we have one son, Alec, who is uh, 15, and uh, they're both great joys in my life. Um, and where did you go to school? Well, I actually went to uh, undergraduate at uh, Kenyon College in Ohio, and I went to uh, law school here in, uh, locally in Boston at Suffolk University Law School. Oh, okay. And what did you do after you finished school? Well, you know, my right after college, I actually... Well, I should tell you actually about how I, in between college and law school, okay. my very first job out of college was actually working in the Reagan White House. I had the honor of uh, working for President Reagan as an aide in the uh, counsel's office. I served as a legal assistant um, in the counsel's office. Did you meet um, Ronald Reagan yourself? I did. I did. Wow. It's actually an interesting story because there's someone here from the South Shore of Boston who introduced me or provided me the opportunity. It was a woman who actually worked in the press office. Uh, it's an interesting story because when I first met Reagan, I was in the White House, and she brought me brought me uh, out to meet him, and it was just one on one. And she said, "Mr. President, I want to introduce you to John Chapman. He's a Republican, and he's from Massachusetts." And Reagan stopped in his uh, stopped in his you know where he was standing, Jeez, yeah. and he looked at me, and he said, "So you're the other one." Uh, <laughs> oh, really? So that was his thing. But anyway, I worked for Ronald Reagan. From there, I actually, after law school, I worked, uh, I worked for the Securities and Exchange Commission as an enforcement lawyer. Okay. There, I led investigations in the financial fraud and, uh, and corruption. And uh, uh, shortly after, after working for the SEC, I worked in a financial services institution uh, as in-house counsel. Mm -hmm. um, I also served, uh, just to give some more back on my background, I served as an agency head for Governor Romney when he was governor. I led the... Uh, the, I was commissioner of the Department of Industrial Accidents, and there I actually uh, am very proud of some of the work I did there. I led some agency reforms there. Um, I speak a little bit about those. I actually had uh, uh, was able to eliminate a 5,000 case backlog uh, at the DIA when I was there. We also were able to save uh, people here in the Commonwealth about over a million dollars a year in outside counsel fees. I hired someone, brought them in, brought the outside legal work in-house, and we were able to save over a million dollars a year. Also, I had uh, the compliance rate for the stop work orders, which is the enforcement mechanism for the department, uh, went from 40 percent to 100 percent under my leadership. Uh, very proud of that work that we did there uh, in the administration. Um, most recently, I served as general counsel as, at Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston. Uh, which was, a, as you know, a very well-known uh, nonprofit uh, in the world and an affiliate of Harvard Medical School. Um, private sector, I've also uh, been a partner at a law firm, Dwayne Morris, uh, in Boston, and as I had mentioned, uh, in-house at uh, a financial services company. Oh, wow. So why did you decide to <clears throat> jump into the race? Well, it's, it's, you know, it may sound a bit like a cliché, Terry, but uh, the reason I got into this race is I think Washington's broken. I think, you know, uh, it's completely lost touch with the people it's supposed to be representing. It's become arrogant and polarized. Um, Congress isn't listening. Our federal government is too big. Our national debt, as you know, is $17.5 and growing. And all we have taking place down in Washington is partisan bickering. And I want to bring back, if you will, as I reflect back on my time working for Ronald Reagan, he was a man who never compromised his values, but he was able to move the country forward. He was able to bring people together. Even if you, you know, disagreed with him, he was able to find the common ground and move things forward. Uh, I'd like to see that back in Washington. Oh, okay. <clears throat> what, are, what did you see are the top issues for your campaign? Well, some of the top issues, the first one that comes to mind is health care. 
I think uh, uh, Obamacare, from my perspective, is really the poster child of everything wrong with the federal government. Um, from the way it was passed on an entirely partisan basis to higher taxes being imposed on businesses and in individuals uh, to broken promises about keeping your health care plan, if you like it. Mm -hmm. Most notably with Obamacare, it's impacting the uh, medical device industry with the medical device tax. And that's a growth industry here in, in the state. And I think that's one that we should be, uh, we should repeal that portion of it. In fact, I would love to see us repeal all of Obamacare. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, it would be. Um, and I think we're at, where would I want to head with it? I think we should go back to what we had here in Massachusetts. We had, you know, universal health care is, is the goal. And we had that in Massachusetts. We had 98% coverage here in Massachusetts uh, back when uh, Governor Romney was governor. And he was able to bring us 98% coverage. And he was able to, um, you know, incorporate health care reform. And, and bring that to the state with that on a bipartisan basis without raising taxes. And uh, that's something we should have aimed for. And we should bring that back. And if we can't get out of Obamacare, Massachusetts should have a waiver from it and be exempt from, from all the uh, overburdening uh, mandates that it is putting upon the citizens here. That's true. What, I guess another major uh, issue would be the jobs and economy. Yes, I think, you know, jobs, jobs really should be the number one priority. We should be focusing on that. Um, with, you know, um, what we really need to do is create a business-friendly environment for business so mm -hmm. people can grow jobs and focus on, invest in job creation and job growth programs. We have in so many of the community colleges here, particularly in the district, in the 9th Congressional District, like Bristol Community College and Massasoit and uh, as well as Cape Cod Community College. Um, these are real opportunities and they have workforce development programs where they can provide training to people. And our businesses, I think what they want to have is they want people who are trained. That's what will encourage businesses to locate here in the district. It will also create better paying jobs. That's what we need, more and better paying jobs. What we shouldn't have is what uh, I think the current administration is doing, but they're promoting, if you will, a minimum wage economy. I don't think raising the minimum wage is the answer. Um, I think it's appropriate periodically and at the right time, but I, it encourages a minimum wage economy, which I don't think is, is conducive for job growth. Yeah, I think there's a recent ADP job report that just came out, and apparently, uh, again, job growth is not looking good at the moment. It's, we seem to be slipping into maybe possibly even another recession. No, that's right. That's right. And, uh, and we need to, as I had mentioned, we need to think of small business. We need to think of the businessmen out there and make sure we do what we can to help them and to encourage them to hire more people. Wouldn't it be a novel concept to lower some taxes? You know, that's been known to actually sure. encourage, uh, you know, job growth and allow businesses to grow. Well, I think uh, actually <coughs> Reagan did it. He, he lowered taxes and it created quite a boom right through to the Clinton years, as I recall. Well, I think good, strong, you know, Republican principles, those of smaller government, lower taxes, and more individual freedom is, is, is one that's, that uh, we should focus on. So what is your thoughts on government spending? You mentioned earlier what we have uh, 3.8 eight trillion dollar budget and deficits. Oh my my lord and, and it just keeps growing and uh, what we're doing is just creating this tremendous burden on our children and our grandchildren. Uh, there's no way we're ever going to be a pay it off. Um, I think you know when it comes to uh, spending and my philosophy on spending is I think we should do in Washington what, what we already do here in Massachusetts. We should have a balanced budget amendment right, right. Um, and we should Washington should be doing what each and every one of us does every month. We sit down at the table, we balance our checkbook, we make sure we're not spending more than we're taking in. That's the responsible thing to do. Right, right. And, uh, you know, that's why I think we should have a balanced budget amendment. That would be great. In, in fact, Terry, just a few weeks ago, I actually made a pledge. The pledge I made uh, to folks was, listen, if I'm elected to Congress, which I would love that honor, the first bill I would file would be to make sure to freeze all members of Congress's salaries until we have a balanced budget. Now, I know that wouldn't necessarily uh, hurt some of them, but it would send a message. And right. the message is, we need to give government back to the people. And the people who represent, uh, you know, all of us down in Washington need to take with them the responsibility and know that their job down there is to balance a budget and make sure government operates 
and, and uh, make sure it operates efficiently. Absolutely. So I guess you're having a primary coming up. What, what di differentiates you from your other primary opponents? But yes, I have a primary. It's on September 9th, Terry. And uh, uh, we, I have a number of primary opponents. But I think the thing that distinguishes me is, is my experiences. As Ed mentioned, I've got experience in the private sector, in the nonprofit arena, as well as, as uh, in, in government. I'm the only person who's actually balanced a government budget uh, on, you know, in, as far as my uh, primary opponents. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only one that has experience in all these arenas. Um, I think government is, uh, having experience in government is important. You know, government has become, sadly, big business. Right. And you need to know how to navigate that. Right, so right. with my experiences, I know I can go to Washington and hit the ground running immediately. There's no learning curve. Oh, that's great. So obviously, if you win the primary, you'll be uh, running against uh, Mr. Keating. How would you differentiate yourself from Congressman Keating? Well, I, uh, I certainly respect Bill Keating. Uh, but I, Mr. Keating uh, has been a, has been a uh, politician his entire life. You know, he's a career politician. Uh, and my view is I, I don't think he knows the district or understands the district. And it's been important to me as I've been running this campaign. I've been going to every corner and nook and cranny of this district, meeting people, talking to voters. And I want to understand it and I want to know it. And I think that's what distinguishes me from Bill Keating. So what plans would you have if you go to Washington in terms of budget and spending? <clears throat> Where would you like to see priorities set or maybe other areas of the budget reduced? Well, as I had mentioned, there's just too much spending. And I think if, we're, if we, and we need to focus on make, identifying some real places for some substantial cuts. Uh, and we need to have a serious dialogue about it. What we have in Washington is really an absence of leadership. We need courage to be able to sit down and sharpen our pencils and make sure we you know, cut the fat where it is. And as you know, there's a great deal of fat there. Uh, we need to make sure that dialogue is happening and to make sure that uh, we can do it on a bipartisan basis. Yeah, I think they're spending, what, the deficit spending runs six, eight hundred billion dollars a year right now? It is, uh, I'm not sure exactly the number, you know, right, I, right, right. You know uh, because if I, I don't want to misquote it, I know it's way too high and it's, in, it's only increasing. Yeah, it's sad because I think for a while the idea was to run the deficits until the economy turned around, but now these deficits seem to be like a, a permanent feature well, of how we're running government. Which and so many understand. of our leaders down there, they don't know a time when we didn't have a deficit. Right. Um, and uh, that's, that's very sad. And what we need to do is get representation back to the people. And again, as I mentioned, the balanced budget amendment is a good start. Oh, we that'd need be to, great. Um, and uh, that's I believe if you had a balanced mm -hmm. budget, the actual pay down of the debt would occur over a period of 15 or 20 years or something. It would just pay itself down naturally. Well, it, you know, we, we, we have to do something because we have an obligation to our children and to our grandchildren to make sure that uh, we leave our, our fiscal house in order. Right, right, right. Uh, I know there's an issue around FEMA and flood maps. I guess there was uh, some some problems around that in 2012? Well, certainly in, in 2012, what you're referring to, Terry, is the Bigger Waters Act that was passed. Um, and um, that, what it caused is some tremendous increases, sometimes double, even, even triple for some individuals on their uh, flood insurance. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not something that is sustainable, and it's not good for the people. Right. Uh, I do applaud Congress, because recently what they did do is they've They've uh, addressed that, and they've given some relief to the citizens uh, who are impacted by this by, by um, delaying the implementation of the increase in, uh, in, in insurance premiums. Mm -hmm. But delaying it isn't making it go away. What we need, as I had mentioned, is courage in our leaders to make sure they sit down and we bring real solutions now. Um, Bill Keating, uh, back in 2012, in fact, along with Bill Keating, our entire congressional delegation voted for the Bigot Waters Act. Uh, there was a small portion or provision in there that uh, provided for the increase in um, uh, flood insurance premiums. Uh, and there was a larger bill. What Mr. Keating is saying is that he agreed with the larger bill, uh, but he, he did not raise his hand. And the question I have for Mr. Keating is, what were you thinking back in 2012? Here is a small provision. Yes, it's a small provision, but it was a provision that directly impacts your district. Mm -hmm. We are, District 9 is surrounded by, on three sides by water. 
And this provision had significant impact on all of the citizens here. And so my question to him is, what were you thinking then? You should have raised your hand and, and said, listen, my district, this is important to us. We need to understand what this is about. My understanding is also fishing is an important part of well, the important issue for this district. <clears throat> Fishing is a, is a critical industry for, for, for the region as well as for the state. As you know, we have generations of fishermen and families that rely upon uh, fishing as, as a livelihood. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's something that runs very personal to me. I have an have a bro older brother who has actually been a commercial fisherman for 25 years. Wow. And uh, he told me, you know, he, he, he's also not short of any opinions, so he tells me what's on his mind about the right. fishing industry. But what we need in Washington is an advocate to look out after the fishing families. Uh, what's happened uh, with, with the federal government is that they've imposed too many re regulations on the fishing industry. In fact, they create uh, catch limits for people who are out there fishing. Uh, I think one of the solutions that we should do is uh, we should provide, if, if we are asking people to limit their catch and not to fish, we should be providing some economic assistance to these families to make sure that they can make ends meet. We have an obligation to do that. They do that with farming. Why not do it with the fishing industry? This is a critical industry. We need to make sure that it flourishes and that we provide the right balance between regulation and, and giving these families an opportunity to provide for their families. Mm -hmm. Another big topic, I guess, is immigration and immigration reform. What are your thoughts on that? Well, immigration, I think, is uh, certainly you know, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I'm for legal immigration and I'm against illegal immigration. But let me explain that a little bit. With legal immigration, what we have is uh, we have four to five million people waiting impatiently in line who've followed all the rules. Uh, and the process is too long and too bureaucratic and it's just taking people too much time to, to become citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to streamline that process. Uh, with illegal immigration, I, I think first and foremost we need to secure our borders. Now we've been hearing that for about a decade, secure our borders, secure our borders. Right, but right. What, what do we really need? What does that, what we need again is we need to get serious about it and take steps to actually do that. And you can do that obviously, you know, um, you know there's surveillance techniques, technology allows us to do that as well as uh, increasing uh, uh, enforcement. I need to focus on securing the border. Second, when it comes to amnesty, I'm not for that. I don't think that's the answer. I think what that does is provide a magnet for, for uh, illegals to come to this country. Um, and that's not something I would, would ever get behind and support. Um, I also think we should probably crack down on uh, those uh, employers or increase the penalties against employers who hire illegal aliens. That's not something... Uh, that's something I think we should be doing. We want to send the right message. and We should not create that magnet for people to come to this country unless they do it in a legal fashion. Well, the magnet should be coming here via legal immigration, correct? Yes, that's, that should be it. And we should streamline that process so they say, hey, and look, we're, as you know, Terry, we're a nation of immigrants. And, and we all have family members who have come to this country. And they've worked very hard. And I think, uh, you know, I think we should be encouraging uh, immigration to this country. Well, I'm an immigrant myself. I came yeah. from Canada, so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what is your thoughts about mm -hmm. small business? They say small business is an important engine to the growth of the economy. What, what are your thoughts about what Washington can do to promote small business? Well, I think Washington has to be focusing on small business. And uh, just to give you some numbers, actually, um, you know, the NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, mm -hmm. has actually rated, uh, given uh, a rating to Bill Keating uh, of 15 percent. That's abysmal. We really should, uh, you know, have a 100 percent uh, rating with small business. Right, right. There's so many of those here, here in the Commonwealth. We need to focus, as I had mentioned, creating a business-friendly environment. And that, how do we do that? We lower taxes and make sure that uh, we give small business and businesses in this commonwealth every opportunity to grow. Yeah, I would think so, for sure. Um, how, what, do you, what is your thoughts around taxes and regulation generally? I mean, there's this view that, that taxes are, are too high and there's too much reg regulation going on in Washington. Well, I think, as I had mentioned, government is too big and it's costing too much to run it. And mm -hmm. that's in large part why we keep raising the taxes. So I b certainly believe in a fairer and flatter tax code. 
Um, there are certainly a, a many, many ideas out there on, on tax reform. Mm -hmm. I think we should explore and sit down and, uh, and, and look at each and every one of them and try to determine what's the real answer. I'm no expert on tax. <coughs> I'm no expert on tax reform, but what I can tell you is that we have ideas out there. Let's have that discussion and have the courage to actually make reform happen. Yeah, I've heard various different ideas float out there, like a flat tax, for instance, or yes. just generally mm -hmm. simplifying the, the tax code. But in order to do that, would that probably require a bipartisan solution in your mind? Well, I think any reform is going to require a bipartisan solution, and it's going to it's going to require courage and dialogue between both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm optimistic. I think that can happen. I think we can get that back to Washington. You know, it reminds me of a story. I, when I was down in Washington and working at the White House, I, you know, I had the opportunity to fly back to Boston. And I flew back and I, had the, and I met uh, Speaker Tip O'Neill right. at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Speaker told me, he said, I was telling him about working at the White House, and he looked at me and he said, you know who I admire most in Washington? I admire Ronald Reagan. And do you know why that is? He said, during the week we fight like cats and dogs. We're on both sides of the aisle, but we really debate the issues. But on Friday afternoon, we sit down, just the two of us, and we have a beer together. And he said, you know, we get more done in that Friday afternoon, uh, having a beer together on Friday afternoon. It was respect for each other, and it was be being able to under, you know, identify where you have common, you know, you agree, and there's some common ground, and you're able to move government forward. We need more of that in Washington. So what are your upcoming plans? For your campaign. Well, I'm uh, crisscrossing the district, and I have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, events coming up on on the books. Mm -hmm. Probably the best thing for people to do is, you know, I, I probably have the opportunity is for people to look at Facebook or to uh, look at my website, and to uh, hear about upcoming events. What is your um, website address? Website address is uh, John Chapman 2014.com. Okay. You can also reach me on Twitter at uh, John at John Chapman 2014. Oh, okay. So it's, a, it's an easy way to sort of stay in touch. I encourage people to uh, like my page on Facebook as well as follow me on Twitter. And on Facebook, they just, uh, they just type in John Chapman to find your page pretty much? Yes, or John Chapman uh, 2014, you know, that's one way to find oh, it. Okay. Or if you go to the website, there's a little icon, a Facebook icon, as right, well as a right. Twitter icon, and you can just click Click right on those. Oh, okay. We try to make it as easy as possible. And when is the primary? Primary is uh, September 9th, okay. uh, which uh, doesn't, you know, was, you know, we've got some distance between now and then, but there's a lot of ground to cover. This is a very big district. Mm -hmm. uh, I've enjoyed getting out there. You know, I'm from Cape Cod, uh, but every day I'm up and over the bridge and down in New Bedford and Fall River. Plymouth County includes the district. We go all the way up to uh, Pembroke, uh, Hanover. Norwell, and obviously out to the islands and up to the tip of Provincetown. It's a very diverse district, and uh, the things that really inspire me is, as I'm out there is I'm knocking on doors. I'm actually listening to the people and, and hearing what their issues are. And some of the issues, really, I thought, is it really health care? Is, is that what really concerns people? Every person I talk to as I'm knocking on doors is telling me it's health care. Right, right. And that's the first and primary issue. They do care about jobs. Mm -hmm. They care about, you know, you know, if they're retirees, they care about their children and their grandchildren getting right. jobs. Right. Um, and, you know, this has been a great opportunity. What we need in Washington now is uh, we don't need lecturers. We need listeners. Right, right. And uh, that's absolutely what we need. And we need leaders and not followers. And what we have with the congressional delegation in Massachusetts is a lot of followers. They just seem to be pulling the same lever that whatever the Democratic establishment is, is, is aiming for with, uh, uh, with Nancy Pelosi and, and the leadership down there. So, you know, I, I've read surveys that say that, you know, the approval rating of Congress is only like 14 or 15 percent. I mean, that's incredibly low. What do you think is the issue? Where is the disconnect? Why aren't they being more uh, responsive to people's concerns and needs, do you think? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, Terry, that you asked me that question because you're probably saying, why are you running for this office <laughs> with that kind of approval rating? But, you know, the disconnect is exactly what I had mentioned at the top of, of the segment, which is 
they're just not listening to the people. And I think congressmen, they don't, they don't listen, they don't know the districts, they don't know the people, they don't understand the people. I would aim to be, have access to all the people, talk to all the people, and uh, listen. You know, even if you don't agree with me on all the issues. As I've been out there, I've been talking to some folks and they say, do you know, John, why we're gonna support you? We support you because as we, we know with your training and your experience, which we think experience matters, um, uh, you're gonna give us a seat at the table and you're gonna listen. And I do believe that to the core. Um, and I've had great experience with that in navigating bureaucracies as I did leading the government agency. And certainly being the youngest of seven children, I navigated an awful lot as the youngest, and I was able to get things done there, too. <laughs> well, I'm the youngest of five boys, so I can relate to that. John, tell us about your endorsements. Well, Terry, I'm very honored to say that uh, I'm uh, the only person in this uh, Republican primary that's garnered some terrific endorsements. Right from the start, I was endorsed by Scott Brown, uh, as well as I've been endorsed by Gabriel Gomez um, and Sheriff Tom Hodgson down in Bristol County. And most recently, uh, Mitt Romney endorsed me, which is, is a tremendous honor. It's terrific to have someone like uh, Mitt on board because he endorses very sparingly. Um, and uh, also, most recently, here in Plymouth County, I got the endorsement of Mike Sullivan, which is terrific, the former Plymouth County DA as well as former U.S. Attorney. I think what that tells me, certainly endorsements don't make the candidate, but what it tells you is that we have a real opportunity to win this seat to have leadership looking at my candidacy, they think I have the right experience, and that I can get things done. And I'm honored to have those endorsements. <laughs> well, John, thanks a lot for coming out to Plymouth here, to PAC TV, and have this conversation with us. You know, I wish you the best of luck in your campaign, and I hope you win your primary, and you go on to become a congressman, a sitting congressman. Well, thank you, so Terry. Thank it's, you. it's good to be here, and thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Terry Ryber, I'm a PAC TV member, and again, I'd like to thank John for coming out. John Chapman is again running for Republican candidate for Congress of the 9th Congressional District here in Massachusetts, and I wish him the best of luck. Thank you.